A very good morning to all of you. Good afternoon. Good evening to others who are watching around the world. Um, we have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Shashi Tharoor, uh, Member of Parliament, Lok Sabha, who is uh, going to be delivering the distinguished public lecture. Dr. Tharoor does not need much of an introduction. Born in London in 1956, Dr. Tharoor was educated in India and the United States, completing a PhD in 1978 at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. While there, he received the Robert Stewart Prize for Best Student and also helped found and served as the first editor of the Fletcher Forum of International Affairs, a journal now in its 39th year. Dr. Tharoor was also awarded an honorary delit by the University of Pugueso and a doctorate honoris causa in history by the University of Bukharest. In 1998, the World Economic Forum in Davos named him a global leader of tomorrow. He is also a recipient of several awards that includes a Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman, India's highest honor for overseas nationals. He has been a longtime friend of Open Jindal Global University, a great source of inspiration for me personally. And he was one of the first persons I discussed the idea of Open Jindal Global University as a young student at Harvard in the year 1999. With those words, I invite Dr. Shashi Taru to deliver the distinguished public lecture. Thank you very much, Raj. It's a, it's a pleasure to join this distinguished gathering for the first day of OP Jindal Global Universities Conference on the theme of universities of the future, which I find absolutely compelling. I might add, by the way, that uh, your introduction of me is somewhat anchored in the past. It shows a measure of how long we've been speaking at Jindal events. That Fletcher Forum is now in its 45th year, <laughs> so you will need more updating. I'm sure we're all in agreement that given these extraordinary times we live in, the theme of this conference is not just timely, but one that is of critical importance to the future of our society and therefore well worth deliberating on in your conference. So congratulations, Raj and Jindal, on doing this. The widespread transmission of the COVID-19 virus and the corresponding impact of the ongoing pandemic has spared no segment of our communities over the last few months. I'm sure many of us have had extensive conversations on the devastating impact on the health uh, and well-being of our societies, on the economic turbulence that is currently being weathered with varying degrees of success by our professional classes, and equally the question of what comes after the current storm passes, and pass it will, but one day we don't know when, what the post-COVID world will look like, is one that has already gained prime importance, at least judging by my own experience, where I've spent a, a good part of the, uh, of the last year and a half reflecting on and speaking about the subject. Now, I know I don't need to explain to a gathering of experienced and distinguished educators worldwide that the present pandemic has also posed a series of existential questions and formidable challenges for universities across the world. Even as more of our planet gets vaccinated, I think it's fair to recognize that the current set of complexities our universities are grappling with marks a watershed moment in their common histories and what decisions you all take will mark a definitive moment for the future of our universities. As um, a member of uh, parliament for Thiruvananthapuram, which is home to a, a number of uh, premier universities in the state of Kerala, and as a former minister in the Ministry of Human Resource Development, now relabeled more accurately as a Ministry of Education, the impact of the current pandemic on our universities uh, and the student uh, community uh, has not, for me, been an abstract or theoretical exercise, but rather one whose painful realities are one that my office and I have actively, actively had to contend with. Throughout the course of the lockdown last year, for example, I personally received emails in the tens of thousands from anguished and concerned students on a number of overwhelming challenges they've been confronted by, ranging from the uncertainty of the administration of critical examinations, what this would mean for our students in the height of healthcare crisis, lockdown related movement restrictions between their homes and exam centers, exacerbated by the lack of clarity on postponements, a general reluctance to hold uh, online examinations, calls from doctoral students who have not been able to undertake the necessary research and field work to successfully submit a competitive and compelling dissertation, uh, or whose research grants have been unconsciously delayed, urgent pleas from students in technical subjects who are unable to undertake internships and accrue the practical experience that are a mandatory aspect of their courses, to the challenges faced by students on the wrong side of the digital divide as classes begin to go online. And of course, a large volume of cases of students 
who have previously been pursuing programs overseas, but were caught in the geopolitical torments of uh, closed borders, restrictive immigration laws, and limited international air connectivity. Now, we know that not all that ails our universities and our student communities uh, is a byproduct of the pandemic alone. But there's no denying that existing problems, the global trend in slashing state support for universities, reduced allocations for research and innovation, and the quality of output being produced, the over-bureaucratization of academia, and the over-regulation of our campuses in India, and of course, the growing threats to the freedom of academic expression, all of these are likely to spike considerably in the post-COVID world if we are not able to find fitting answers to these very questions today. At the heart of the matter lies the challenge. What policy should be pursued to preserve democratic access to the best higher education and to match individual talent to intellectual aspirations as well as societal needs? <clears throat> Universities are coping with various demands of students for impressive qualifications, of employers for usable skills, of the economy for innovation. But most universities are still set up in the classic mode to operate in the realm of values and culture, to be concerned more about political issues and market conditions, to be in short the ivory towers so disdained by hard-headed employers. Now for most families in India, these utilitarian concerns are realities that we are particularly familiar with. Perhaps more so because the fact is that in our country, our educational system has historically served as a beacon of hope in a tumultuous world for millions, even if arguably the system in itself has not yet become our greatest glory. It's of course imperative to remember our humble beginnings on the eve of Indian independence. Britain's crippling and debilitating colonial rule left us with only 16% literacy, barely 30 universities, and about 700 colleges with an enrollment of just four lakh students. While India struggled for the next five decades as the poorest, most illiterate, most malnourished and least gender sensitive country in the world, with over half the world's illiterate adults and 40% of the world's out of school children residing in India, the trajectory of our progress to our present state is remarkable. But Jawaharlal Nehru's vision and efforts to systematically build up a very large system of education and create a large pool of men and women um, equipped with robust scientific and technological capabilities, sensitive humanist and philosophical thought and profound creativity, we started an education revolution and revival. The initial catechism in our education policy were two E's, expansion and equity. Expansion of the number of institutions and equitable access to them for those who had previously been denied educational opportunities because of their caste, their gender, their region, their religion. In the process, we did not always focus enough on a third E, excellence. There were shining exceptions. Today, Americans speak of our IITs with the same reverence they used to accord to an MIT. And one day I hope Jindal will be spoken of the same way. The image of India has changed from that of a backward developing country to a sophisticated land that produces engineers, doctors, and computer experts. The old stereotype of Indians was that of snake charmers and sadhus. Now all Indians are seen as software gurus and computer geeks. Now in 2021, when I recall my days as a young graduate, uh, more than four, four and a half decades ago, I think of how few were the options available to us in our college days, in the 60s, early 70s, as compared to the plethora of opportunities presented to graduating youngsters nowadays. Wider options to study, wider employment opportunities to prepare ourselves for. Evolution means that India must keep up with the world. The IITs have now launched certificate programs in artificial intelligence and machine learning. One has set up a center for artificial intelligence. At its very foundation, Nehruji called IITs India's future in the making. And now young professionals from these institutions are indeed making global history. But we still have a long way to go with that fourth E of employability to meet the forces of markets, the demands of research, the pursuit of usable knowledge, and the imperative of building an equitable society. We are suffering from a systemic problem of skill mismatch between qualifications and jobs undertaken. I remember reading with horror about the Madhya Pradesh Police Department in 2016, advertising 14,000 constable posts. Nine lakh candidates applied for these 14,000 jobs. 
Among them were nearly 10,000 engineering graduates, a dozen PhD holders, almost two like graduates, 15,000 postgraduates. The minimum qualification for this post was just a higher secondary education. There are similar anecdotes for every menial job advertised by the railways, the state and central governments, the public sector enterprises. Why? Because we are releasing graduates into an ecosystem that does not know how to settle them. They settle for a constable post as an alternative to frying pakoras, as some who ought to know better have advised them to do. Therefore, even as I speak to you as someone who has benefited from a liberal education, right from my schooling through to my time in university, I do recognize that there's naturally a desire in India to make higher education more utilitarian, to link it to the needs of what we hope will once again be a rapidly growing economy in a globalizing world. This is an argument that I understand and empathize with, particularly in a society reeling from the impact of the pandemic, as we seek to explore all avenues to make up for the devastating economic losses and a more hostile job market. Uh, we have the highest unemployment ever recorded in our country today, while we also need to bolster our preparedness to weather such turbulence in the future. After all, as I'm sure many will be quick to point out, a university graduate now employed as a salaried professional is likely to have been better off during the pandemic than say an artist or an actor or a commentator on 19th century poetry. Now, while this is a fair concern, I empathize with it, I partly counter it by arguing that what our higher education system liberally aspires to do, or to rephrase what liberal education generally aspires to do, is to essentially equip you for any job that you might get. As I've often pointed out in addressing some of our engineering institutions, we produce five lakh engineers a year in India, half a million, and 66% of them end up in jobs that don't require an engineering degree, <clears throat> either because their degree is not relevant to the jobs that are available or because the quality of the education they've had is not good enough for pure engineering jobs. To put it plainly to my mind, if our universities abandon the pursuit of liberal arts for more technical and utilitarian needs in the post-COVID world, this would not hold our graduates in good stead. The principal challenge that would be prompted by universities discarding the liberal arts for more technical and utilitarian objectives is that it will leave our countries with a generation of graduates who are trained to look at the problems of the world through absolute and non-negotiable principles. This works, this doesn't work, this which turns off, this which turns on, there's only one way of doing things and no other. If our graduates are rooted in the idea that there's only one way to think and work, they are likely to apply that habit of mind and thought to the understanding, to their understanding of the world, of human beings, of politics, of ideology, where only one worldview is true and right, everyone else is wrong, where only one worldview is patriotic and everything else is anti-national. That doesn't work. As I've often pointed out, the human mind is like a parachute. It functions best when it's open. You don't want to jump off a plane with a parachute that will remain closed. And similarly, you don't want to produce graduates who enter the post-COVID world with a closed mind. Our traditional utilitarian approach in India has been to shove facts into the students from school and college onwards, make them memorize stuff which then regurgitate in the examinations. Today, rather than a well-filled mind, what we really need is a well-formed mind. You can get the facts off the internet if you like, but we need individuals who are able to react to unfamiliar facts and information to discover new information, know how to understand it, how to fit it into a pattern, how to understand the problems and dilemmas that information poses, how to approach solutions for these problems. And I say this because an Oxford Martin School study recently predicted that 30% of the jobs in the world by 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today. How can you educate young people for jobs that don't exist? By teaching them not what to think, but how to think so they can make the new understandable, bring the distant near, make the unfamiliar into something they can handle. A well-formed mind benefits far more from an appreciation of history or a knowledge of literature or a study of the way in which real human beings behave rather than the world of certitudes that our technical education provides for. So my submission to this distinguished gathering is that the future of our universities, indeed of our higher education system, lies in striking a careful balance between the utilitarian needs that our technical education is required to provide 
and the broader liberal aspects that will help our graduates expand their horizons and cultivate their intellectual sensibilities. In order for us to make this balance, however, there's a need to be cautious of a more recent trend among policymakers to try and make liberal arts and humanities education more relevant, almost as if they are trying to reduce this branch of education into an exercise of producing more effective white collar workers rather than producing deep rooted thinkers. Equally, as we've seen in recent years, there is a very real threat of transforming liberal arts for more insidious purposes. To convert history, for example, into an instrument to legitimize a more Hindutva aligned version of the past, or similarly to transform political science, or as some would say, entire political science, into lessons on chauvinistic nationalism, or even transforming an obsolete English literature into, quote, communicative global language skills for prospective call center employees. Such exercises will not culminate in an expansion of the intellect, but on the contrary, would constitute a travesty of our higher education system by failing to leave any room for the imaginative, the ruminative, the philosophical, and the theoretical. This also requires us to focus on the importance of the freedom of academic expression and to ensure a sacrosanct separation of powers and influence between our campus spaces and forces that would like to bend our higher education for ulterior gain. These are dangers that have been highlighted by the famous Hindi scholar Purvanan, who in his own collection of essays, under the title, The Idea of a University, has warned against the growing assault on academic spaces by right-wing forces in our country that are determined to establish an exclusionary and linear worldview and entrench narrow-minded chauvinistic dogmas on our campuses. His is an argument I believe is well worth engaging with in the context of understanding the future of universities. The truth is that in the globalized world that we live in today, in the diverse democracy that we are and must preserve and protect, our students are increasingly likely to be surrounded by others who do not necessarily subscribe to their point of view and may not share the same sets of beliefs and convictions or even the same set of cultural practices, culinary preferences or customs that they affirm. In our own country, we've seen how the rejection of liberal cosmopolitanism has resulted in an increasingly fractured society where many of those in leadership positions today are unable to look beyond our differences and regard our diversity as a problem that must be contained. There is a growing deficit of individuals who are able to look at people of other religions, other races, other languages, and actually recognize that ultimately we actually do share the same dreams, the same fears, and the same hopes. Sadly, too many are incapable of broadening their minds in a way that understands the myriad manifestations of the human condition, while at the same time appreciating the universality of human names and aspirations. In producing the graduates among them, our universities sadly have failed us. It is vital that our universities must therefore be courageous enough to remain as free and open spaces where dissent and multiple worldviews are welcome and cherished for their complexity and diversity, and which ensures that in our rambunctious, chaotic, and magnificent democracy, spaces and channels are kept open. The future of our universities must be rooted in developing a generation of leaders that is more ready to deal with a national and global order, a world where multiple realities can coexist, where alternative worldviews and convictions have to be encouraged and negotiated with, and where students are taught to look beyond themselves and their immediate surroundings to the reality of interdependence and peaceful coexistence. I would therefore suggest as you consider the future of universities, that in tomorrow's post-COVID India, we should try to see the very idea of the university not as a fixed list of immutable characteristics, but in the British educationist Robert Anderson's words, as a set of tensions permanently present, but resolved differently according to time and place. These tensions include those between teaching and research, between autonomy and accountability, between intellectual integrity and socioeconomic relevance. But they also feature legitimate debates in our country about benchmarking Indian universities against the international scholarly community, about their role in shaping our national identity and defending national culture. The idea of the university must reconcile the tensions between the inevitable connection of public universities with the state and private ones with the most powerful and richest corporations versus the need to maintain critical distance from both. Between reproducing the existing social, 
economic and occupational structure against expanding it from below by promoting the marginalized and excluded through affirmative action to ensure social mobility. They've been serving the economy versus providing a space free from immediate utilitarian pressures dictated by the job market. Above all, there is the chronic and perhaps permanent tension between universities as places devised to discourage open and critical attitudes against society's expectation that universities will impart useful qualifications and employable skills in the service of India's future. Evidently, in resolving these crucial tensions, a balance must be struck that seeks the impossible to reconcile seemingly incompatible objectives with the ethos of commitment to a better future for India. We must be far-sighted enough to recognize that at its core, in a democratic society, our universities must evolve into spaces where an ideal version of democracy itself is allowed to thrive. In other words, our universities must become the staging ground for experiments in developing the most principled version of our democratic ethos, and by extension, a microcosm of what our democratic society one day could be. We cannot, of course, reach these ideals if we do not actively strive to ensure that our campuses are inclusive and representative. After all, no democratic model can sustain itself if it does not carve out spaces for all voices, no matter how big or small, to be heard. This is not just what we try to rectify through instruments like affirmative action and need-based scholarship programs. I know you have a few agenda, these are undoubtedly important, but a commitment to really taking stock of the barriers to access and inclusion that permeates all levels of our, all levels of our society. To use one example that I briefly touched on, as classes rapidly go online in the COVID era, we as a country have not sufficiently addressed a deep and pervasive digital divide that many families have to contend with. We live in a world brought to us by Facebook, Google, and Twitter, but we also live in a world where over 3.7 billion individuals do not have access to the internet, including 1 billion children for whom it will not be possible to either work remotely or learn at home. According to UNESCO globally, only just over half the households, 55% have an internet connection. In the developed world, 87% are connected, but that's 47% in developing nations and just 19% in the least developed countries. These stark realities, along with other barriers like infrastructure deficiencies, basic access to electricity, reliable Wi-Fi, teachers equipped to use digital curriculum, <coughs> have resulted in insuperable barriers for our weak and marginalized. There was a sobering and tragic event in my own state, a class, student, a class 10 student in Kerala, hailing from a Dalit family, a young girl who was a class topper and under any other circumstances would have been set for a bright future, instead committed suicide. Why? Because as classes leapt online, her family, where the sole breadwinner was her father, a daily wage worker, was unable to afford a smartphone or even repair their TV sets, which would have allowed this girl to follow the classes necessary to continue her education. This is the reality of the India we live in, realities that educationists cannot afford to forget while we sit here protected by our privilege and discussing what a university means to all of us. But it doesn't have to be this way. Our current resort to online education also overlooks the great value of campus interactions for students across social classes and regional or religious divides, and the comradeship that arises from shared experience and shared learning across these divides. Some have argued that after the initial arduous period of adaptation, online education will become the new norm, that the university campus as we know it will become obsolete. I do not agree. So much of what we learn at university comes from outside the classroom, from friendship, discourse, the discovery of new interests through clubs and associations. A physical campus space is intrinsic to all this. And above all, the, intrinsic, the, the university campus can be a place where people of different backgrounds can be brought together, where the social barriers of class and caste are left behind, and where instead young Indians are given the tools to lead an empowered life. A space that is confident enough to look at its wealth of differences as a strength and not so insecure as to look at it as a weakness that must be rooted out. A space where the administration is attuned to the aspirations of the students, the next generation of India's leaders, and where these young minds 
the engines of our democratic and pluralist society are not subsumed only by personal ambition or the commercial rat race, but are invested in the success of those around them. We manage to do all of this. We can develop an idea of a university that remains open, inclusive, and representative, an idea which will become the engine of India as we discuss the future. If we can manage to do this, I'm confident that the India of the post-COVID world will be carried forward by a generation of leaders that will be able to take our country to new heights. I believe it can be done. And you, as you discuss the universities of the future, are the ones who can help us all to do it. Thank you for giving me a hearing. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarur, for that uh, fascinating uh, tour de force on the challenges associated with the universities of the future and some of the more contextual implications of COVID and how it's going to affect the future. I am conscious of the fact that we have uh, little time uh, for a Q&A session. A number of questions have come in. I want to begin by a question that uh, many of us are concerned about, which is that uh, having studied both in India and abroad, one of the things that uh, many developing countries, including India, faces is the, is the inability to attract the finest minds to academia. How do we create opportunities for young uh, you know, scholars or young graduates across disciplines to choose academia over other uh, you know, possible professions? And that has been a biggest, one of the biggest challenges that India and other developing countries face, which is quite different from uh, some of the finest institutions around the world. I agree entirely with you that it's a genuine challenge. I've noticed this, uh, that amongst uh, my own peers, for example, uh, very, very few of the bright students went into academics. And of those who did, um, I would say that, um, I would say that um, they, they stuck out as exceptions uh, to a general rule where if you got good marks, you went for a well-paying job in universities and, 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 and schools, never paid well enough. Now, uh, obviously, pay is part of the answer. Um, the financial basis of education in our country has to be improved to a level where teaching can be a remunerative and attractive profession. Paradoxically, those who spend significantly on their education feel impelled to earn that back uh, in the salaries they draw. Uh, and, and therefore, the best educated minds are going out of the education space, which seems illogical, but that is the social reality. And I think, therefore, increasing salaries is an extremely important. The second is a little more intangible, but it's what I would call the glamour quotient, which is missing. When I think of the traditional place of the guru in Hindu culture, in ancient Indian culture, the reverence with which the teacher was regarded, uh, that has fallen down a long way in modern India. Certainly the 20th century India, where I went to school and college, um, that kind of reverence was largely absent in the attitude of students uh, and family and their families, the teachers. Uh, in fact, uh, when schools, uh, uh, teachers were often seen as people you could pay a little extra to give tuition to your, to your child for. Uh, in colleges, uh, they were by and large seen as those who didn't make it uh, into uh, more rewarding professions in terms of salaries and money like the IAS or whatever. And that respect has gone down. So one definite um, approach would be to try and promote, uh, shall we say, a greater public recognition and admiration for teachers. I tried to encourage this when I was minister. I talked to television channel into giving an award, uh, but the exercise lasted just one year. No one tuned into watching that award ceremony. Even the national award for teachers, which is given by the president of India, no less, uh, uh, gets very, very little publicity and traction. Um, my friend Sunny Varki in the UAE uh, announced an incredibly generous um, uh, World Teachers Award uh, for the best teacher in the world each year on the basis of nominations received and gave away, if I remember right, a million dollars. That might even be low. It may be a higher figure than that uh, every year. Uh, again, uh, there was some publicity for the initial award. I haven't seen much for later. In fact, an Indian <laughs> teacher in a village in Maharashtra won that million dollars. And uh, an incredibly generous man, he shared that prize with the five other finalists from around the world. But I mean, this kind of thing attracts a lot of media attention briefly. Does it enhance um, uh, the attractiveness of the profession? Not sure, because obviously, if you have um, a few million teachers in India, 
how many of them are going to get that $1 million prize to aspire to? We need to do something in our society in every state, ideally in every town, to place teachers on a higher pedestal and give them a kind of recognition that would make the profession more attractive. So these are two ideas, but I recognize that uh, they don't solve the problem uh, overnight. Thank you very much, uh, Shri. Uh, there's another uh, question, and I think there are several questions surrounding it. Uh, as we focus on the development of a knowledge economy, uh, there is very strong emphasis on engineering, sciences, and technology, including issues surrounding uh, you know, innovation. Uh, do you, how do we address the fear of the neglect of uh, humanities and social sciences in the larger context of education system? While the national education policy does talk about it, from the standpoint of institutional policy and institutional ecosystem, how do we ensure that the humanities and social sciences are not lost in this race when it comes to educational opportunities. But you know, uh, frankly, uh, uh, that was what the thrust of my speech was. It was, a, it was an exhortation to respect the valuable role that liberal education plays in our society and why it is so important uh, in our society, uh, especially given the current trends in our society to preserve that. So uh, I don't want to repeat the arguments since I've made them at length in this talk. And, those who miss them, uh, as the questioners may have done, can, can go back and watch it on YouTube. I would congratulate you, Ajindal, for starting the School of Liberal Arts. I think that was very important to do, especially since you started off as a professional university focusing on legal studies. Uh, the importance of being able to balance one set of considerations with the other, of balancing the, the professional skills, the utilitarian skills, the scientific engineering and technical skills, legal skills, and so on, on the one hand, with the need for a broad-minded humanistic education that liberal education provides is to my mind indispensable for the survival of our society. Um, I have even suggested in a couple of speeches that every engineering student must compulsorily be obliged to take a couple of humanities courses. Uh, and indeed one could argue that every uh, liberal arts student should take uh, a, a, a foundational course in science so that they are exposed to some of the classic basics of, of scientific thinking. We need really well-rounded minds in our society if we're going to survive uh, as, a, as a viable, functioning, modern and progressive India. And that's why uh, I would insist on, on, on doing both. Well, we have the last question for you. This is regarding the, the issue of research, uh, particularly evidence-based research for policy making. To what extent universities need to focus on that at a time when a significant part of public policy making is not necessarily based on evidence, what should universities do so that they can inform public policy making in India and other parts of the world? That's an excellent point, Raj, because, you know, one of the things that surprised many people in India when the world, I mean, when Indians started taking notice of the world university rankings by reputable international bodies was the extraordinary amount of importance they gave to research and then to citations of published research. Um, the percentage, if I remember correctly, in the Times Higher Education is 30% of the weightage is for research and another 30% for citations, which means that unless you are research oriented, uh, you are never going to figure in those rankings. And in India, there was a bit of a cultural problem there because for many, many um, years, perhaps a British legacy, our universities were mainly teaching institutions where little research was done and research was done in other institutions where no teaching was done. And so there simply wasn't um, uh, the kind of thing that today is the hallmark of a highly rated international university. So the first answer is to give priority to it, and that is to make sure that every university insists upon a significant research component, particularly in its postgraduate studies and degrees, but also in many cases, why not in the final year of your bachelor's as well, insists on some sort of research project or research or mini thesis. Uh, the other thing is, of course, resources, which we can't uh, underestimate. Uh, you know, we are a country that has 17% of the world's brains, and we produce only 2.7% of the world's research output. Uh, why is that, you could argue? Because we put so little money into research. Amongst the major economies, I think our share of um, GDP going into research is well below 1%. I think it's 0 0.76 the last time I checked. Uh, whereas uh, many governments, including my own in UPA, I'll admit, had pledged that we would spend 2%. Uh, on, on, on research, which we're simply not doing. So I think it becomes extremely important 
to put more money into research because research costs money. And very often, some of our better research-minded brains are fleeing abroad because that's where the money is. And of course, with money comes facilities, particularly in the sciences, where you need you know, sophisticated equipment, labs, and so on. Um, so the two things I would urge is, 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 is uh, more importance in every institution, make it compulsory, and more resources. On the resource front, one of the things that I, right now I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. I used to rattle them off when I was minister. But one of the striking things about India, unlike the OECD countries, is how reliant we are on government funding for research. In the OECD countries, government barely gives 10 or 15 percent, or maybe even less than that, uh, of the total amount of money devoted in the academic world to research. The bulk of it actually comes from the private sector, whereas in India, the private sector gives a very modest contribution, I think two or three percent, rather than 75 percent in the OECD countries. And we rely overwhelmingly on the government to give more than 80 percent of all the research funds. I think that's wrong. First of all, governments are becoming leaner, understandably. Secondly, the tax base of governments is getting more limited. Indeed, tax policies are often reducing tax intake. And you're looking at a situation where the ability of governments to finance research is getting more and more straightened and squeezed. So the obligation, the imperative is very much for uh, the private sector to step up to the plate. Many of them can have advantages, particularly in the sciences and engineering, by financing research for products that one day they could manufacture and sell. So it's actually a win-win for them. But I think we need to see much more involvement of uh, private sector funding in the research space in India. Thank you very much, Raj. It's been a, a pleasure uh, addressing this, this very interesting gathering. And I look forward to um, seeing the results of your conference when uh, so many others will have shared their thoughts on the future of universities. Thank you very much and uh, deeply appreciate your presence. And uh, thank you for a fascinating lecture and also your uh, comments and responses to the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarug.